Coming up in this video, I'm going to show you how I paint an Iron Jaws Warband for Warcry. Welcome back to Mini Junkie, everyone. My name is Jarrett. So when I finished off the three core warbands that uh, launched with Warcry, we're talking about Splintered Fang, Corvus Cabal, and the Unmade, and the, the Untamed Beasts, and the... Iron Golems from the corset, I found myself wondering what to paint next, quite frankly. I'm really into the Warcry setting and, and launch, and I enjoy the game with my kids, so I wanted to keep, I'm kind of in a Warcry groove, and I wanted to keep that going. A couple of people commented and suggested Iron Jaws, and I do happen to have a couple of, well, a set of brutes lying around, so I thought, let's get those guys out and paint them up for a warband. But in full transparency, I don't love the brute models. And let me clarify that. I actually really like how they look, but I find them a pain in the butt to paint because of the way, mostly around their neck and their head, how they're all very recessed into their armor. I found that challenging to paint and, and a little bit annoying to paint. Also, they have those weapons that are, they're cool, they're chunky, but they have these big flat surfaces and very shallow depth to the details and, and the, the sculpting. So those I also find a bit challenging to paint to make, to make them look good. I also don't love the yellow color scheme, but at the same time, when they're painted just as metallic, I feel like that's kind of drab and, and dull and not very interesting visually. So what happened is recently, um, Marco Frizzoni- Hello guys. I hope I'm saying his name right, at Not Just Mecha, NJM, painted the Iron Golems and he did them with like a very heavy, heavy rust effect on all the armor. And I decided to steal that, frankly, uh, because I think I thought to myself that that would look really good on these orcs. And he said something really interesting that I think applies to pretty much how I approach all of these videos. You need to keep a mental library of every kind of wanted or unwanted effect. Sooner or later, everything comes handy. That's essentially my philosophy is that when you watch a tutorial video about anything being painted, I mean, sometimes, yes, you're looking because you literally want to paint that model or those, like, let's say, that chapter of Space Marines. But for me, it's more important to watch the videos and watch for techniques, colors, effects that you can then immediately think to yourself, how can I apply those to other models I want to paint in the future? So when I was watching the Iron Golem video, I'd already painted the Iron Golems. I was just watching for techniques he's going to use that I can think of other uses for and entered the brutes. But I will say I, I use his technique and promptly don't do as good a job of it by any means. He spent hours on certain aspects of, of touching up and doing highlights and, and shading that I, that I didn't do. And I went for pretty quick results. And that's okay. At the start of any project, you ask yourself, how good do I want these to be? How good do I need them to be? In my case, I'm into the brutes, but not like super excited by them. And so I just wanted them to look good on the table and be good for gameplay and I put my effort in accordingly. You should do the same. If you're new to the channel, I, I cover all kinds of miniature painting related stuff. I'm all about tutorials, commentary, tips and tricks and things like that. So consider subscribing if you find that to be an interesting topic. All right, let's see how I paint these Iron Jaws Brutes. Here's a look at the completed Iron Jaws Warband that we're going to be painting today. So believe it or not, these guys were actually fa fairly well along towards being finished and painted, and yet I wasn't super happy with them anyway. So I decided to strip them, and I stripped them in a bath of super clean, but that doesn't get every piece of primer off, but it's very, very thin amount, so it's fine. I also had not built a leader, and I have no idea why, so I had to rip this guy's arms off and build him as a leader. I started out by priming these guys with premium white primer from Vallejo through my airbrush, and I'm going to paint the skin yellow using Vallejo Game Ink with a little bit of Flash Gets Yellow in it. That I'm adding because I want to just increase that opacity. I was finding that the um, ink alone wasn't quite covering enough. I want to increase the opacity but have it run quite nicely and smoothly and easily. Especially when I'm trying to apply it in amongst the recessed areas where their head is. Because of, like I meant, like it's hard to reach the brush in there. The reason I'm painting it yellow is we're going to be using contrast paint to do the orc flesh. And contrast paint, by definition, works by showing a little bit of what's underneath it. And by using yellow, I'm going to get sort of these yellowy green highlights and probably just a richer overall green look. I also feel like that if it's just white, it's going to have the green feel kind of, I don't know what it, how to put it, like flat and sort of uninteresting and and the highlights will look a little bit one-dimensional or 
lack of a better way of explaining it. So funny enough, we're going to use Orc Flesh from GW's Contrast Paint Line. And I'm using this right out of the bottle. I'm not thinning it with any medium. And right away, hopefully you can see how that yellow that we did underneath, I should add, make sure that yellow is completely dry before you start this step. But you can see how it's coming through as the highlight and giving it a much more interesting highlight than if it was just lighter green via a white undercoat. So that's why we took the time to do that yellow. You're just going to go through and cover all the yellow flesh with this. You know, be fairly generous, but at the same time, wick up any pooling you see with your bristles of your brush so that you don't get sort of unsightly excess dark shading pooling in, in various areas like the crooks of elbows and, and whatnot. So I decided to use Shaiish Purple for the pants as I have it on pretty good authority that purple pants go well with green flesh. Same thing as always, we're going to take it right out of the bottle and just brush it on to the pants, uh, being neat, trying not to go outside the line, so to speak, and wicking up any excess pooling you find. Any of the wood handles on their weapons were covered in wild wood straight out of the pot. I use snake bite leather to contrast with the darker wood on the weapon handles, just doing all the various wraps with this color. Now gore grunt of fur is used on some of the cloth that's hanging down like loincloths and tabards. Uh, by the way, from this point forward, if I, I'm not going to say wick up the pools anymore because Every time you use contrast paints, I'm hoping I, that you're getting the point that you should do that. By the way, I also obviously used it on their wrist wraps. And also, um, unless I say otherwise, I'm always using this right out of the bottle and not using a thinner or contrast medium. Whenever I use that, I will specify. Now, to mix things up a little bit with this technique I'm using from Marco, I'm going to take some typhus corrosion and try to create just a little bit of texture, a little bit of roughness on the various armor panels. So a lot of those armor, well, all those armor panels are still white before we go in with this rust treatment. And I'm putting this down because I want the rust treatment to cover the roughness of the typhus corrosion. However, we will be coming back with it later. It goes on, it looks like crap, literally and figuratively. But don't worry, that's going to all kind of come together as we go on to further steps. This one I would say is a bit optional if you don't have typhus corrosion. It's a subtlety that I think you could skip if you wanted to, but I did use it. While the typhus corrosion is drying, I use Sigor Brown uh, on the boots. There aren't very many boots in this group. They're either armored or barefoot, but there's one or two sets of boots, so I used it there. Now the typhus corrosion being a dark brown against white is really going to show up through the contrast paints as a color. So I had to paint over those and I'm using a bit of gray sear and a bit of P3 Morrow white. You can use any white you want. Essentially we're just trying to cover up those dark blotches with a color that's close enough to the white of the armor. And I didn't bother to thin it down because I actually don't mind in this case if it goes on a little goopy and a little thicker because we want the rust to have a textured look anyway. So I just took that right out of the palette and just no thinning and just blotched it on over top of anywhere that I put the um, typhus corrosion. So here's how that armor looks with the rough patches now that they're dry. So here's the basis of our rust that I learned from Marco in his video, Griffhound Orange. Agaros Dunes, five drops of each. I'm just measuring these out using a brush because I don't have any pipettes. Uh, I should probably get some actually. I'm just going to mix these together in a palette well to be applied. And if, if need be, you just make some more. I would say just start with one 
grouping of five and five uh, so you don't waste too much of the contrast paint because as we know it is not cheap then again just one drop of medium trying not to you know pollute your your jar so make sure your brush is clean when you dip it in there and we're just going to mix it up and start to apply it all over the armor so yeah, I just brush it on pretty heavily. Um, we're not being neat and tidy here other than to make sure we're not getting the orange on the green flesh or any other browns that we've done if possible. It is tough to work around some of these. Like I said about these sculpts, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of jutting overhangs and things like that. So it can be a little tricky. Just do your best to cover it all up. Don't worry too much if there's a green spot here and there that you're covering. Overall, we want a fairly irregular surface anyway. As Marco said, we're just applying this messy because we want that irregular and blotchy surface. And yeah, just apply it. Um, don't even worry too much about pooling, despite what I always say. I think a little bit of pooling in this case is a good thing. And we want to cover any of the sort of jaggedy metallic armor sections. I would leave a few of the, you know, sometimes there's bolted on bits of armor. I would leave some of those um, white because then we'll come in and we'll treat those a little differently to give it some variety. Now I'm going to use Riza Rust. We're going to be adding a little bit of highlighting and a little bit of shading the way Marco did. I'm using a small brush that I'm using to stipple. Uh, this is an old small dry brush that I've treated badly and so it's good for stippling. Uh, so don't use your best brush for this because it's really hard on the brush. And I'm just taking that Riza Orange, which I think is different from, like he used a slightly different set of uh, oranges and dark colors and that's fine. We, we don't necessarily have to completely replicate his look. Uh, this is going to leave a little bit of a texture and a little bit of a brighter orange to create some visual interest on the rust. Uh, and so that's why we're dabbing it and we don't mind if it's getting a little clumpy and a little bit brush strokey looking because we're trying to create a sense of texture. Now Marco used a desaturated brown to shade the rust. I'm going a little different, partly just to make it my own thing. I would say it doesn't look as good, but you can you can use either technique. That's the beauty of this. So, uh, but I'm doing is I'm taking the the uh, typhus corrosion and I'm using my small dry brush and I'm just stippling it into any shadowy areas, using my finger to wipe up excess and just kind of keep it contained. Uh, primarily, like in those recessed areas right under the edge of their pauldrons and, and things like that. So I'm just dabbing it on. I'm not going to be covering it up. I want it to actually stay dark and brown. To create some lighter patches and speckles I'm going to use Tau Light Ochre and I'm using that again in a stippling fashion. I think this is a different stippling brush but you get the idea of using something old and that's going to take a bit of a beating. And I'm just trying to hit some of the higher points, edges, little bits on the ray surfaces. Uh, you, there you can see I put way too much but yeah, this is going to, again, create a little bit more pattern and variety to the rust. Here's just a quick look at where things stand with the warband as of this step. Now I sprayed everything with a matte varnish. I'm using an airbrush, but I want to make sure that that rust is very, very matte looking. And I did it before doing the metals. I like to retain a little bit of a sheen with the metals. I'm using Vallejo metallic paint steel. It's a very very dark paint. It goes on really really nicely with a brush. I'm just going to brush that onto all the weapons and any little bits of metal that are left. For example the small bits that are bolted onto the armor like I talked about. A few of them also have daggers and, and belt buckles. Things like that. You want to cover all of that with this metal. Now any of the bone decorations they have on shoulder pads or, on the, or in the face area. I'm just going to come over that with Skeleton Horde. I love this paint. I don't. I saw in a recent YouTuber video that they said it's exactly the same as Seraphim Sepia. I would say it's a little different and I like it better for bone. So I don't mind having both paints in my toolbox. 
Now I'm going to use some chain mail, my mid-range uh, metallic, like a Runefang steel. I'm going to dry brush these weapons very, very lightly. Um, you want to really make sure you take almost all that metal paint off in this case. It's simply because the details on these weapons are extremely shallow. So all that little rippling and uh, you know the edges that are in there, they're, very, they're not deep. So any kind of dry brush you do is not going to... There's a risk of it sort of streaking across the whole surface and not looking very good. So very, very lightly. But I didn't want to do a wash at this point and I just couldn't really figure out how else to pull out that definition. Now I'm going to use Mithril Silver, which is like a storm host silver, because I need to still create a little more interest in these weapons or they're going to look too too dull. I'm going to pull out the, the edges of each weapon by pulling straight down towards the edge in quick strokes and intentionally leaving little gaps here and there between each stroke so that it looks like a, a not so uniform, not so perfect kind of edge or very jagged and you know etched edging. And I'm not actually going all the way up to the very start of the weapon edge. You, hopefully you can see I'm leaving a little bit of a dark line just where the edge begins on the inside of the weapon there and then going bright right towards the edge of it. And then I'm also going to edge highlight very carefully using the side of the tip of the brush just again to pull out some details around the various surfaces of the weapon and the back edge of the weapons. I should note that I keep saying the weapons but I actually mean to apply these steps to also any of the smaller panels of, of armor that you did in this metallic color, any other little adornments, anything you painted with the steel color should also be getting these treatments. Fun fact, when I have a blob of paint left over, especially on my dry palette, I will actually scoop it up with a bigger brush and put it back in the bottle because I don't like to waste. Now I'm using Shaiish Purple just to fill in those little sort of teardroppy shapes or fang shapes they've got. They're kind of recessed into the armor in a few spots. To highlight the bone, I'm going to use Vallejo Model Air Aged White. You could absolutely use Ushapti Bone or Screaming Skull. I like the Aged White. It's a nice color, but also any Vallejo Model Color paints, you can pretty much hand brush right out of the bottle because they're pre-thinned for airbrushing, so they flow really nicely without needing to add any flow improver or thinner. And I'm just hitting all the high points, the ends of tusks, the ends of fangs, um, any jaggedy spots, raised areas on skulls and teeth and things like that. I'm not doing the teeth of the actual orcs because I'm going to use a slightly different shade just to distinguish it from the bones. Two of them have open mouths and I took Caraberg Crimson and just tried to shove it in their mouths and <laughs> it really doesn't work very good. It's The tongue stays green and uh, I don't know. It's, and the, frankly, it's hard to access the, mouth, access the mouth because of the design of their armor and where their, their teeth being so large and jagged. So we'll come back to that. But take Evil Sun Scarlet and we're just going to dot in each of their eyes. Their eyes are very, very small. So take your time, use a small brush, hold your breath and brace your hands together to, to do this neatly. They even have little sort of bottom eyelids. So that whole eye socket isn't their eye. It's just the little top circular part. But I had to do something about those mouths, so I took Flesh Terror's Red and again shoved it in their mouth with a brush. Well, okay, a little more carefully. But I already knew from recent ex experience that that was going to cover well, so I used that. Retributor Armor to paint the one little piece of gold on these guys, which appears to be a trophy of a Stormcast mask, which is great. And just paint that whatever color you want, ideally gold. Now Ushabti Bone, we're going to use that for all the teeth and also the any fingernails that are showing and you'll notice I hold the guy upside down and I pull away from his gum line uh, don't be afraid to twist and turn your miniatures to create easier access but also I find and by the way I'm just uh, painting a tooth where it's a mouth and that was wrong uh, and when I make a mistake I actually quickly lick off the paint and I just use my spit to clean it off it's gross it works I don't know what to tell you but Back to what I was saying, when you are painting something like this, it's easier quite often to pull down to do your brush stroke. I don't know why, something with physics, uh, and to keep it neat. So I, I like to paint teeth in a pulling down fashion. So I'll turn them upside down to do the bottom teeth. Any messiness we got on their flesh can clean up really nicely with moot green. I'm just using this out of the pot because there's so little of it going on and it's easy to keep it from getting too brush strokey. But Anywhere that the rusty looking wash has touched the green, you can touch that up with moot green. Now at this point, anywhere that there's a little strap I missed, I go back and hit it with Saigor Brown. 
and then I took Nuln Oil and I just painted it on the flattest parts of these weapons, just trying to create, yet again, a little more visual interest and break up the monotony of just the steel colors. So not applying it on the edges, just applying it onto the flat parts to darken them and dull them down a little bit and just distinguish them a bit from the edges. And with that, with the bases done and tufts applied, we're finished. This is the finished warband. I'm pretty happy with how they turned out. I just realized after the fact that they look a bit like... Um, Tale of Painters did a, a tutorial on these, and they, they also used orange armor. So I think the orange, green, and purple look pretty cool together. And I just wasn't feeling either the yellow or just plain armor. So this is a fun experiment, applying some things I learned from Marco's video, and I hope you enjoyed it. There's a few different ways you can support the channel, which I'll leave on the screen here. But other than that, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.